First, I'd like to ask you, have you uh, done an oral history of interviews or case studies no, or really. any other kind? No, no. We should ask that, just ask if we can have access to it. Or no, I haven't. I haven't. Well, Danny, maybe we could get launched if you'd sort of tell me how you came to your calling. In the, the Episcopal priesthood or to All Saints Pasadena? Well, no. first the Episcopal priesthood and then All Saints. Both. I, as I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, the Episcopal Church was very important in my life. The rector there was a wonderful man. And so my mother had died when I was a very small boy of five. And, and when I was about ten or so, I began to see this Episcopal minister, and every once in a while I would go to church there. And he was just wonderful to me. And so I was, my father is a, was a Greek immigrant, so I was baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church, and that was my church. But in a little place in Knoxville, they didn't have a Greek priest except once a month from Atlanta. So I'd go to the Episcopal Church. And I, I, I liked it, and I liked the minister. And so I gradually drifted into the Episcopal Church. And when I went to college, I stayed there helping him do things. And, and so I made the decision. It was just a simple decision that, that I felt I had some gifts. I loved the church. And I just said, here I am, I will be of what use I can be. It was very uh, a simple kind of decision that it was important to me, and I felt I could do some good there. Now, what's kept me in for 34 years is a lot different than that, that but it was just the desire to use my gifts in a place that I felt was very important to me and the world. And so I've had three jobs in the 34 years. I, I went to England when I was ordained, and I was a graduate student there for almost two years at Cambridge University. Then I, I had a little small church for two years in Pulaski, Tennessee, where the Ku Klux Klan was organized. And that was really hard work. And then I went to Nyack, New York, for seven years, just outside New York City. And then I've been here 23 years as the rector. And I came here because I had heard for years that it was a church that was very involved in social and that the rector before me, John Burt, who went on to be Bishop of Ohio, was a very uh, strong advocate for racial justice and the hard issues of society and healing those. And so when somebody said uh, that job was open, or are you interested? I said, I was. And so if he put my name on the list, and one day a man called me and said he wanted to come and hear me preach. One thing led to another, and I came when I was 36 years old, very young, and somewhat inexperienced, but excited about the kind of foundation on which I could build a ministry. And I was right, and I've not been disappointed, and I'm very... Um, I feel very excited about my, my work here, my ministry, and what I've been able to do and what people have been able to do. Well, these are some of the things then that have kept you in it, as you say, for right. 34 years. That's right. Excitement of it. Um, now, uh, these uh, ministries were uh, well started under your predecessor. No. The, the, the no, tell so. how. Don't well, some of them again, John Bird was here from 1957, well, 1956 to 1966. Those were hard years of 
social ferment and turmoil. And John's calling uh, was to be a prophet out on the front lines. And uh, the church was not a church anywhere in America that dealt well with the issue of racism, segregation, injustice. And so in those years, for John to begin to say the church is complicit in that horrible uh, state of racial injustice, that the church must do a better job in its own um, house, and it must be, do a better job in the community where black people are very much disadvantaged. And so his job was to say that and draw people into an awareness of it. And so programmatically, All Saints did not have a substantial social action ministry. It had a growing consciousness, uh, a very much growing sensitivity to that is what a church is supposed to be doing. My task was not to diminish that personal witness, but, but to try to bring the, the community of, of the church, the parishioners, the leadership, uh, to bring them into an alliance with me in doing some of those, those ministries. And so um, I began lots of different things. I mean, the first thing I did was a very hard thing, and I think I made a serious mistake. Uh, the United Farm Workers Union representative called me and said that John Burt, my predecessor, had been supportive of them, and they wanted to come and have a, a table out on the lawn, uh, you know, some place where people come and get information about the struggle of Cesar Chavez to unionize the farm workers. And I said, well, John Burt was your friend. I'd be glad to have you. And I didn't know much about the farm workers. And so in church that morning, I'd been here maybe two, three months. That morning in church, I said, well, representatives from the United Farm Workers Union are here and they have some information to share with you, and I'm sure that you would be interested in that and would be supportive of them. And so I encourage you to go by. Well, sitting there in the congregation was the largest corporate farmer in America. And he was so incensed with that sort of, um, uh, sort of unfair in his mind treatment of the hard issue of the farm worker and the farmer that he caused such an incredible turmoil that I spent about six months trying to make my way through that. Now, we did end up with a very significant ministry with farm workers. We established a, a daycare center in Delano out of this church, and we've been supportive of the farm workers' ministry but I didn't start it very wisely, and it was difficult. So, but each... Um, was this corporate family a member of your... Yes, but he left. Very big, big, big farm. Very big. He, I never could repair that breach. I tried. Now, there are several people in the congregation involved in farming and the agricultural industry in his corollaries. And I've maintained some good friendships with them, and many of them have stayed with me in some conflict, but we've stayed together and they've supported me. But, but when I, I began to be involved in the Vietnam War protests in 1970, I took a strong position on that, and I asked the parish to open itself up to that issue and to join me in establishing a peace center, 
right at the heart of the church. And so we did that. And, and so the parish was very much involved in that. I gave leadership to it. They knew where I was standing, and I gave energy to that movement. But it was a deep involvement of the congregation, deep involvement of the leadership. They had to come aboard on that. Well, this marked the difference between the way you launched that and the way you launched the farm workers. Right. That's right. And so we did pretty good work. We, we, we had a struggle. And Pasadena is not a, a community where you can oppose the president of the United States and oppose that war and try to stop it without great pain. So it was a hard piece of work. And there are some scars still here. I mean, those, uh, a group in the church formed called Save All Saints which was really a group trying to get rid of me as the rector. Very powerful group, wealthy people and conservative people. And they, they sent out letters to the congregation um, asking the congregation not to support the, the uh, fund drive because of what was going on. So if they could cut us off with the money, we would they would have to terminate me. But it didn't work. People were supportive. And so that lasted about four years, that struggle, from about 1971 to 1975. So I think that having made, gone through that struggle and stayed with it, somewhat uncompromisingly, but we compromised in some places trying to sort of keep enough people with us. But we were pretty hard on it. So we tried to love each other and listen and have meetings and try to resolve conflict. I think that that experience marked the kind of church we are. Mm -hmm. And we survived it and we came out stronger. Mm -hmm. yeah some of these conservative people and strong members of your yeah. congregation? Yeah, a lot of them left, but some stayed, a lot of them stayed, uh, and they have be, remained supportive. They don't agree with me on a lot of issues, but they've remained supportive, and uh, they come a lot. Uh, some left, and I grieve that departure, but it was very important. Um, the All Saints has taken a very much of a leadership role in the civil rights movement as well. Could you say something about that? Well, one of the, the early controversies we had was that we wanted to try to make our commitment to what was talked about in the late 60s and early 70s, self-determination in the urban black community, is instead of all the, the patronizing that has gone on with, um, with so much of the... Kind of empowerment of yeah, the So we really wanted to to go into empowerment, self-determination. And so we, we took some money and, and gave it to several groups in Pasadena. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. And so uh, it caused lots of conflict. It wouldn't cause any conflict today in this parish if we decided that was a ministry we had. But in 1967, 68, that was not where the mind was. I mean, empowerment was to bless black terrorism, you know. And so, uh, the time of all of A lot the, of people were just scared. They were just scared. Mm -hmm. So, but we did it, and we did some important work uh, in 1975 when Pasadena was the first community outside the South 
for federally ordered school integration. We were very much involved in that, and we organized our people to help. And I think that we were a significant enrichment to that process towards an, a new kind of education system in Pasadena, quality, integrated education. Uh, it has always been, um, um, it's always grieved me that um, All Saints has not had a larger percentage of its congregation made up of minorities. Uh, I'd say we probably have now 10% of the congregation that are minorities, but in Pasadena it should be larger than that. So a lot of people are distressed at that, and we work at it, and we're very much involved with the black community, but there is a black Episcopal church in Pasadena, and there are black congregations in Pasadena, and so do you think that will be a persisting thing, that there will be a separate Episcopal Church for white people? Uh, well, it's an anomaly because it was started for the servants, you know, oh. Oh, that's interesting. 50 years ago, mm -hmm. when people would come out for to spend the winter in Pasadena, they would bring their servants, and that kind of... And it still survives as a black Well, church. small, church. small. I mean, they're good people, they are wonderful people, and they have a good rector, but it's very small. But very segregated and no well, it's all, well, it's all black. So it's a dis distressful phenomenon, but... Housing, 
you've got to have skill centers where people can get tools for education. Uh, you've got to really have a social work network where people can know what is available to them. I mean, you, you've got to you've got to get them into health. Thirty plus percent of those people are mentally ill, yeah. uh, and so what we've tried to do is to divide, is to develop those uh, uh, ancillary ministries that are an important part of breaking that cycle of homelessness. We started a, a, a skill center. We were the primary movers behind it. We got the city, fathers and mothers, uh, PCC, and uh, public education board, all three, to go together and form a Pasadena Skill Center to, to equip people for, for some kind of work. I mean, unskilled people can't survive in this society. So, and then we, we went together with uh, two other churches, uh, three other churches, the Roman Catholic Church, the Methodist the Presbyterians, and we, when they wanted to sell the YMCA, 120 uh, SRO uh, rooms, uh, we said you cannot take those rooms from Pasadena. So where do people stay? So we now own that, that component of the Y building, and we've gotten money to, to renovate them. And so it is just important that that we haven't been willing to just say, we'll give you a cot for the night. Not that there's anything wrong with that. God knows they need that. But to bring uh, a fullness into that life, as much of a wholeness as we possibly can. A lot of people um, are into the AA program and the... Uh, Cocaine Anonymous program, and they meet twice a day at Union Station. And uh, it's amazing the number of people who feel uh, that for the first time in their life they have been able to, to get off of drugs and off of alcohol. It's been an important enrichment to that whole ministry. Because, you know, it's, it's I mean, so many of those shelters are on that evangelistic side that say, you know, you got to accept Jesus and you got to do these things and then we will feed you. We will. And so uh, we've stayed away from that. We, we just say we want to make you healthy. But we want to provide those Places where you can gain the health through therapy sessions, through AA meetings, uh, through coming to the health clinic, through coming to the social worker that can maybe get you into some kind of, of federal health, state health. So it's, that's been our ministry. We think it's a very religious ministry, but it's not self-consciously religious. Do you think the psychiatric medical effort is is meeting the need quantitatively? Well, I don't think so. I think it, yeah, I, I mean, the fact that it is ecumenical has allowed us to do more work mm -hmm. without any question. But it's, it certainly does not meet the, the total need. That there are some that are going on shelter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what's going to be the solution? Well, I think that part of the solution is the growing awareness that a, a healthy, just society has no place for homelessness. That if we're going to have a healthy society, we must find a way to deal with homelessness, and we must break that cycle. I mean, when President Reagan 
said that the, the, that the state mental institutions were no longer helpful and no longer needed, and that those large institutions were going to be closed down. I mean, that was not all crazy. I mean, there was something unwise about those massive programs. But uh, he didn't, and no one following him has created then the alternative method of taking care of mentally ill people. And so society is just filled with the mentally ill that are not able to work, that are not able to manage life, and so they're on the street. And, they, and, and so I think the answer is a society with a much greater social conscience, a society where presidential leadership and congressional leadership says that the kind of society that we create means that public health and public wealth are primary and that we're not going to sacrifice public wealth for private wealth and that, that we give that vision of the kind of new society in which, which, um, in which people uh, are seen to be precious and sacred and that the resources of, that we share together are made available. That doesn't solve it. Yeah. That's not going to solve it. There's some utopian dimension to that. But I think people are beginning to see there's just not uh, just a lot of crazy optimism that is, that, or, or romanticism that talks about a new society. I mean, the old society isn't working. See, people are not happy with the kind of society we have created, I mean, the children in this society are, are in desperate place. I mean, the, probably the first society in the history of civilization where children are vastly worse off than their parents. And, and so, who wants that kind of world? being crashed. Yeah. yeah. Who wants that kind of world? And so I think that people, if given some leadership, People will come to the place where they see that what we do with each other and the kind of healthy, just social community we create, the more we gain from it. It's not, I'm just doing something for you and I get no return. It's, if I can create a world where all of the children have a healthy life, a good education, good opportunity to work, I get a payoff for that myself. I live in a better place. And we just somehow have not been able to get people to get caught up on that and buy into it and they think that they just, I mean, what can we have for ourselves? I mean, how much can we reduce taxes? How much money can we put into our own bank account? And the presidential leadership and the congressional leadership has not given an alternative vision to that. And so, so the greed part in us is just nurtured. Yeah. Yeah. I know that uh, All Saints has addressed the uh, problems of children, too, and I wonder if you'd say something about the office of creative connections. Well, it's really a wonderful piece of work. We celebrated our centennial six or seven years ago. And part of that centennial was that we wanted to make a gift to the city. We didn't know what that should be. And I had a, a woman in the parish, Denise Wood, who had worked at Marlborough School and had just retired from being dean of the school. And so I asked Denise Wood to come and talk to me. I said, Denise, I'd like to hire you for three months and pay you a thousand dollars a month for three months to go out into Pasadena and just talk with people and try to see where we could make a great contribution to the city. 
Well, not too long after interviewing lots of people, she came back with the idea of the office to create a connection. With the idea being that the church is that connective tissue that brings together resources with the problems. And it was a remarkable idea. Non-adversarial but tough, and that was her style. And uh, she would really focus on those problems, but she wouldn't try to whack everybody around. But she had that wonderful grace that allowed her to put the searchlight on those problems and then raise up resources and, and connect them. And so out of that came uh, the children, the Healthy Children's Program, with uh, Lorna Miller, who took her place, has done wonderful research on that, and has, in part of Denise's research and Lorna's research, was the revelation of the just desperate plight poor children are in health-wise. I mean, just desperate, just desperate. And, uh, um, I mean, the revelation that only one pediatrician was willing to serve poor children in all that thing. And so that, that research revealing that uh, the children of Pasadena were in a very unhealthy state, and then drawing together the medical community, good people, you know, people don't want that to be the state of reality, drawing together hospital administrators, doctors, uh, therapists, uh, nurses, and, and working through a program of, of uh, attending to poor children in the schools of Pasadena. And it has really been a remarkable program. We've raised a hell of a lot of money. I mean, over a three-year period, she has a $360,000 budget to do that. And Lorna has raised about $180,000 from Foundation Dish. So that, that it is really, a, I think, an important piece of work. Uh, I think that uh, if you look at the plight of children, there's no way to call America a great nation. We can't treat children the way we treat them. And I think some people are being helped to know that, and they are willing to see that transformed. We, you know, we've been very much on the, the pro-choice side of things. That's been a lot of conflict. And uh, uh, what we've said around here is there would be far fewer decisions to choose abortion if we could get some help for prenatal care, if we could get some help for, uh, for poor children when they're born, if we could get some help in feeding them. I mean, if, if these mothers knew that it would not be be bleak beyond description, they would not opt for an abortion. And so part of, of creating a society in which abortion is less and less is to create a society that loves children, mm -hmm. that cares for children, that, that won't trash them, that cares for pregnant mothers. Well, the, the, you have taken a strong pro-choice stand. In yeah. Yeah. Well, I have, and the church has. I mean, I've taken it myself. I mean, after the Webster case um, decision um, last July, I preached a strong sermon on the pro-choice issue. And then I called together a group of 25 women that I knew would be supportive and interested and said, all right, I've done my part of that and I empower you to take it. And so we have created a wonderful ministry of women working on that pro-choice issue and all of its ramifications. 
and say it's not just me. Yeah, tell me about that. How have they picked up well, the ball on that? What are they doing? Well, they, they are involved um, in legislation, trying to, to understand what the legislative issues are and being advocates for choice. They, uh, they run seminars all the time on an education arm, advocacy and education arm, where, where uh, we're just constantly doing workshops and seminars like Sunday the 30th we're going to do another a forum with that pro-choice task force sort of saying where we are on the, the issue uh, they are involved with the, the Healthy Children Project of OCC in that that, that part of our ministry is not to say we're pro-abortion, we're pro-choice, and we want a society in which abortion is less and less a practice, and therefore we must create a different kind of society. And so we have some people working on that and on sort of the whole uh, sex education dimension, uh, and. Uh, is there an active sex education component in yeah. the youth education yes. program in the church? Yes, yes, not as much as it ought to be, but we are working on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I we have been very straightforward on on that, and it distresses people. And, I mean, when you say if 50 percent of teenagers are sexually active, then that's a problem to be addressed. And so let's talk about condoms. That doesn't mean to say that we feel that uh, it is healthy for a 14-year-old boy or girl to be sexually active. You know, they're complicated and very difficult. And so that's another issue. But if that is the reality, then we're saying that we want to to try to, to prevent those pregnancies. A lot of people are working on prenatal care and trying to get more prenatal care. Then we part of a couple of the people in that task force deal pastorally with our dissenting people that find that a difficult posture to see the church take you have some uh, who are very strong for, call it, pro-life. Yeah, yeah. And how is that going? Well, I think that we have done a good, we've done all right with that here. We've, we've worked hard at it. We've had all kinds of meetings with the, the congregation. We've written position papers and sent it out and talked about it and redrafted them and redrafted them and redrafted them so that people feel that even though the orientation is pro-choice, how we do that and what is the basis upon which we do it, uh, we are really open for people to help shape that. So I think that, that the people are pretty much there. And uh, you mentioned the um, um, Alcoholics Anonymous among the homeless. You also have quite a big program in the congregation generally, uh, self-help group. Mm -hmm. Well, we have, a, we have a pretty substantial uh, community of people working on alcohol and drug abuse. It is a very active group. They, they have all kinds of programs going, and uh, uh, we have once a month a Eucharist that is for, uh, called a recovering Eucharist. And people come to that who are recovering from drugs and alcohol. And people come to that who have friends and family lovers 
bouncer is recovering. So we have about a hundred people come and we do the communion together in the Episcopal Church with grape juice instead of wine. And they love that. And then we have a potluck supper and just sort of all together. So we, and then we have as an offshoot out of the Office of Creative Connection, we have a program called Day One. And it's a program that is dealing with the issue of drug and alcohol abuse in the larger community, and a, an education program and a treatment program. And that, has, that came pretty predominantly out of the Office for Creative Connection, but that has become more of a, of a community-wide thing now. It, we house it here at the church. We're trying to make it more ecumenical. Yeah. Well, all things are generated. There are a great many pilgrims that have kind of taken over in the yeah. community and become community-wide and, uh, and ongoing. Community -wide. Like we have, we have a huge AIDS ministry. We have a we have an AIDS service center. It's a very big operation. Hard work. Oh, it's hard work. Now, this is all things. So all things AIDS it's service all center. Things, yeah. mm -hmm. And. It's over on Pasadena Avenue. We rented a place. We sort of wandered around. We started out here, and then we rented some space at the Y, and, and we just continued to expand. Um, but it it is that is not ecumenical so much. That's still all saints at this point, but it's got to become more and more others because. 1991, we're looking at a budget of about a million three hundred thousand dollars for the service center. For the service center, and so we're out, you know, hustling money all the time to keep those programs going. But um, it is very important work, and um, AIDS, um, Pasadena. Outside of of Los Angeles, Los Angeles and and Hollywood, all of Pasadena is the third highest rate of AIDS in the state. And uh, a lot of of accelerated growth um, in persons with AIDS in the minority community in Pasadena. So the work is enormous. The task is well, the All Saints makes a, an outreach to uh, the gay and lesbian community as well. Would you tell us something about that? Well, that has been an interesting evolution. I'd, I'd say for the past seven or eight years, it's become, it has been more of a conscious embracing of the gay and lesbian community. I think ever since I've been here, we've had gay and lesbian people in the congregation and people who come to see me with struggling with that issue and from various perspectives. But seven or eight years ago, several gay men came to see me and made it very clear that they did not feel that I was sensitive enough to the gay issue, that the church was not resourceful to them enough. It, they had needs that were not being met here, and so we struggled around and uh, discussed that, tried to understand it. And out of that came uh, what is called the Gay and Lesbian of All Saints, Gaylas. And it really is a, a a very defined community of gay and lesbian people who meet in mutual support a couple times a month. Uh, it's published in the newsletter and in the service, and, and it's, they are as much a part of the central ministry of this place as the altar guild is. And so that's been an important thing. Um, and so that visibility and that statement that you're welcome here, that you are called into completely 
equal ministry has had a, has been a powerful message to people who have been abused deeply by the religious community. I mean, the religious community has been historically very abusive uh, to homosexuals. And so a, a lot of homosexuals love God and they love the Christian community. And so it's been difficult for them to live with that abuse. And so to come into a Christian community that says, we accept you, we love you, we call you into service and to leadership has been a very powerful thing. And lots of gay and lesbian people come. We have about three uh, gay men on the vestry. So that... Uh, three the, men that now feel to our country. Oh, yeah. Very, very... And there's a congregation of the whole very receptive. Yes. I think they are receptive and... And, uh, I mean, the, the issue of human sexuality is a hard issue. It's a hard issue. And so it would be a mistake to say that, that everybody is at peace with that. That is not the case. The people want this church to have the ministry that it has. And I'm now facing, I mean, I've been putting it off and putting it off, but the, the issue that is most central now to that gay and lesbian community is I will finally say they are equal in membership if I will bless a same-sex union and call it holy and allow the, a lot of the, the gay and lesbian couples who have a committed relationship, been together for years, feel that they are all alone. And, and they want the church to say, we bless you on your way, we support, we undergird that. That is a good relationship, it's not a corrupt, soiled, uh, uh, aberrant expression of human sexuality. And, and so the way you do that is to, to bless our unions. Well, the church, the Episcopal Church nationally and Anglican Church worldwide has not accepted that. But I am struggling with that in my own mind and how to deal with that because it's a very central issue to that community. You mean you might do it ahead of the church nationally or internationally? thinking about that. Mm -hmm. But that would create great controversy and whether that's smart and helpful to the total ministry of this place, I don't know. But I'm thinking very seriously about it. Well, it sounds like there are times when conscience just comes up against yeah. the congregation and church policy. That's right. Mm -hmm. but the, another thing that that has been, I wrote some of these things down so that I wouldn't forget them, but another big issue that I started discussing earlier on our Vietnam War opposition is that we've been very much involved in uh, all kinds of peace work. I mean, we established 10 years ago, 79, with Leo Beck Temple, West Los Angeles, an interfaith center to reverse the arms race. Very important part of our life, my life and this church's life. And then in 83, we became a sanctuary church. We, we, we developed a, a Central America ministry that was trying to, to say something about national policy and also dealing with the effects of national policy. Those people seeking sanctuary, we became a sanctuary church. Uh, we, we tried to develop a, a ministry to those people who were trying to escape political perse persecution. And we were also trying to say something about the national policies that fed that persecution. 
so we, we've done it. We've had a lot of people go to Central America. We've had a lot of people involved in that saying no to the continuation of that war in El Salvador, and we're saying no to the Contras in Nicaragua. So, and then we we have built a church around saying that that the arms race is destructive not only to our souls, but destructive to the economy and to the social fabric of the nation. So uh, that whole peace thing has been an important part. Of it. Would you explain what a sanctuary church is uh, exactly? A sanctuary church is a church that says that refugees from uh, El Salvador and, Nicar and uh, Guatemala, uh, who cannot be given asylum in this country, cannot become immigrants in this country, uh, be because they are termed, uh, because uh, the law of the land does not allow it. And they are not allowed to be uh, accepted as, as uh, immigrants into this country. And so at the, uh, we have tried to, to change the refugee law so that, that uh, the people from El Salvador and Guatemala could be termed as political, uh, political refugees. The federal law and the uh, um, immigration service would not allow that. They term them economic refugees because to say that the war in El Salvador that we were funding created a persecution that made the people flee from the country was unacceptable to the government. So we said that we will allow you, even though you, as refugees from El Salvador and Guatemala, we will allow you to have sanctuary. Does that mean they actually come into the church? Well, we have a house. We bought a house. A sanctuary house. We bought a house. Mm -hmm. And they came in, and we've had, we've had a number of families that with us over the years. Mm -hmm. Well, this involved the church in civil disobedience? Yes. You know? But we have, I mean, very luckily, uh, we have not had any uh, federal officials invade us on that. I guess they chose a couple of places as, as uh, cases to be lifted up and to show that you will be uh, prosecuted, like the ones in Arizona. But they have not done that at any of the places in Los Angeles. They're four or five. Is your, is your sanctuary house, is it continuously occupied? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. But the, but the issue of being a peace church, we worked through several years ago what it meant to be a peace church. And that's very important to this place, is that you know, uh, how, how, how do we, uh, how do we witness to the fact that as a Christian community, we're called to be the advocates for peace? And so we really worked on that from all kinds of angles. It's always going against the tide. Always going against the tide. Always going against the tide. All the rhetoric, all the media. I mean, like the Persian Gulf. Problem today very complicated, but the stream is a fierce stream of support, and now the the momentum is building that even though it's a standstill and uh, Saddam is not going to invade Saudi Arabia, it's the time now to strike and get rid of him and get him out. 
amazing to me the, the media support of that. So that, I mean, the, and therefore the population says 80%. Uh, we were right to send the military. The population is not informed. And now about 65% say that uh, uh, that it is okay to go after Hussein militarily. So, I mean, uh, it is something to try to produce an alternative vision to that. But that's what we're about. It's hard. But it's also an exciting piece of work. What else did you write down there? Well, that's about, about. I've got, got it. Well, you know, the, the other thing on the homelessness issue is that we went in with Leo Bat Temple, not only to forming the Interface Center to reverse the arms race, but we went in with them in buying three hotels on Skid Row in Los Angeles at Fifth and Main. Uh, the toughest place in L.A., I mean, that tough place. And we bought these three hotels, and for about just under $10 million, again, that we hustled from all sources, we renovated those three hotels and made them a real oasis of hope and dignity in the middle of that. Is this the, the collaboration with uh, the temple? Mm -hmm. Something quite uh, unique. Well, it was the first. Time it, was the first time, it was the first time uh, we there has been uh, there has been two other projects on the drawing board of of Jewish synagogues and and other churches in L.A. trying to come together to do that. So we're hopeful that more will follow in our way. But it's been a hard work. It's hard work, but wonderful work. I mean, people just love seeing what happens when people walk off of those streets of just such clutter and filth and degradation into a place that says you're precious, you're an important person, you are a human being treasured, and here's a chance. Some appreciate it, some are able to respond, and some are too bruised. Yes. Well, the, the uh, rabbi must be, your opposite number there must be quite a kindred spirit. In well, yeah, we've been friends for 20, it, Leonard Beerman and I have been closest to friends for 23 years. And your your uh, projects are for the homeless and other projects? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the interface the, center the on the arms race oh. and, the, and, the and the hotel are the two places. Now, we've traveled together all over the world on peace issues. But that's a, that's a quick run through of at least what was on my mind as I thought about it. Um, what do you wish that you did achieve that you haven't so far? Well, I think that, I mean, so many of the problems still exist. Uh, and so that that is discouraging. I, I wish, I wish I had been better able to communicate on some issues, and uh, I had worked harder to to capture the attention of people. I mean, you hardly got any hearing during. Uh, the 1980s on the arms race, for instance. I mean, what Reagan did is just unbelievable. And so I, I soon left 
the danger of nuclear cataclysm. I mean, that was a real issue. And I began talking about what it was doing to, to us as a society. And I kept talking about what it was doing to us economically. When 70% of all scientists were in the military, what does it say about our own technological development? What does it say about our economic competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera? You know, nothing. And now we wake up to this incredible disaster. We wake up to we uh, a second-rate power uh, economically that uh, we have so damaged the social fabric of this nation is almost irretrievable. And so, I, you know, all those years I, I kept trying to say that, and I sort of wish that I'd worked harder, been more forceful, push, push, push harder. I regret that. I wish I could have done that. It, it sounds as though you have uh, been very uh, intelligent and bringing your congregation along in some of these social movements and uh, uh, overcoming opposition that you've met to some of these things. No, we've done a lot of that. I, I feel good about that. I, uh, we've done a good job. It's a, it's a never-ending job because new issues create new conflicts that require new energy to build community and work through it. I think the other thing that that is weighs heavy on me and disappointing to me is has been my inability to get very far on the idea of the solidarity of the human family, the solidarity of the citizens of Pasadena, that, that really you can't have a healthy city with Plaza Las Fuentes here and nothing that is established out here for the economic enrichment of the poorest part of our society. I mean, we have now the rich Carlton being built where the old Huntington was. Now, I'm all for the rich Carlton. I mean, if that's what is needed, it's needed, I'm for it, I'll be successful. But for a city to be successful, you can't have a city all excited about the rich Carlton, but not excited or committed to finding housing for the poorest of the poor. And that polarization, we've seen it increase, haven't yeah. in the last, uh, through the 80s? And oh, significantly so. Mm -hmm. And so it's a real failure not to see that in very clear ways we are bound together in a, in a society. That, I mean, from a religious point of view, I mean, that's the way God has created the human family, that we don't live alone, we live together, and that my destiny is tied up with everybody else's destiny, and I cannot be healthy if my sisters and brothers are sick. And that is so lacking in our society. Well, just on the immediate scene, do you see this message about the human family uh, taking hold and certainly firing people up to action? Well, here and there it is. I, I, mean, I, don't, I think that if I allow myself, I can become very pessimistic about it, and I don't. I sort of try to keep looking at what we have accomplished and what can happen in the future, but I don't, I mean, everything in America indicates that rich people do not see their destiny tied inseparably with poor people. That in the world we do not 
see the strength of Western democracy um, tied to the development of um, Brazil and uh, Panama, etc. I mean, until that kind of solidarity comes into reality, I think that that we are in a bleak place. Well, how do you contrast where we are now with uh, 34 years ago when you came into the ministry? Well, I think that I think people are more aware, more aware that the church is task is to do the kind of things that we've been talking about. Uh, a lot of people disagree with it around everywhere. They would disagree that a church should be doing that. But I think that over these years, it has been established that the church, the religious community, need to be involved in alleviating the pains and suffering and injustices of people. And there are lots of ways to do that. And I think that when I started out 34 years ago, that was faint, faint. You know, the, the um, Methodical Church is, has kind of a stereotype, I think, at least an old stereotype of being exclusive and excluded. Exclusionary and uh, you know, um, right? No, I know. Uh, certainly, that uh, all saints give the lie to that old stereotype. Yeah, I think it does, and I think that's what lots and lots of people enjoy about this congregation is that it is a very inclusive community. And you're welcome here, and people come here off the streets. And, People come here out of mansions, and people come here who are gay and who are straight and, and divorced and married. And, and um, so that's that's very important. I didn't want a church that wasn't that way. And so it's it's good. I think that that it's a task to be inclusive. I mean, there is. I mean, the exclusivity is just very deep in us. You know, I mean, that business of embracing everybody and saying, you know, you're part of my life, come on in. Is that hard? That, that is the epitome of grace, you know. That and a lot of hard, hard, <laughs> hard work. Yeah. <laughs> that, that comes through, I'm very impressed with it. And how successful you've been in so many things. Yeah, I'm glad that we could talk. I'm glad. Are you retired, really? Uh, yes. Uh, I'll turn this off in a minute. Right. But uh, I, uh, I uh, should have labeled this at the beginning, so I'll label it now. Right. This is uh, Elizabeth McBroom interviewing uh, Dr. George Regis in his uh, office in All Saints Episcopal Church in Pasadena on September 19, 1990. Thank you. You're welcome.